Hey everybody, Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant at Sony headquarters in New York City. Today is RX Day. First, a recap of the RX Zero, an action camera which ought to give GoPro conniption fits because it's got a one inch sensor and a Zeiss 24 millimeter full frame equivalent rectilinear wide angle lens. Something that I really like. It's my favorite wide angle focal length. And then, the RX-10 Mark IV. Now, we're going to go through a shooting event a little bit later this afternoon. I'll be able to go hands-on with it in, in more detail. The signature uh, shortcoming of the RX-10 Mark III, a camera that I like very much, was the use of contrast detect autofocus. But with the Mark IV, they've gone to phase detection that should make a big difference and make this a wonderful sports camera when you've got enough light. The second thing that they have on this camera that's particularly interesting to me is touch autofocus. Now, in all candor, when I uh, got to use the A6500, I wasn't that impressed with touch autofocus, and pretty much this is, in theory, the same system. So, we'll see how that works, too, a little bit later this afternoon. We start with David, nice and sharp, cut over to Mark. That works really, really well. Can you do it again? Okay, so there's David. Just move over there. Mark is nice. And there's Mike from Sony. And just swipe back. That's actually really, really nice. This is the first touch implementation I've seen on a Sony camera that I like. Yeah, I said that. Say you want a high quality. Image stabilized 600 millimeter f4 telephoto. I don't know, you're a birder, a sports photographer, a urban landscape photographer, a peeping Tom. No. In the full frame world, you'd have a choice of really one, but we'll say two Nikons and one Canon. The 12 pound $4,500 manual focus AIS Nikkor 600 f4. The eight pound $12,300 AF S Nikkor 600 millimeter FLED VR or the eight pound $11,500 Canon EF 600 F4 to USM. Of course, then you either have or have to buy an appropriate body, say the three and a half pound $6,000, 16 frames per second though, only in live view, otherwise 14, Canon 1DX Mark II or the ever so slightly lighter $6,500, 14 frames per second though, only with fixed focus and mirror lockup, otherwise 12 frames per second, Nikon D5. Although you could put either one on the already legendary $4,500 Sony A9 with an adapter, though you can forget about native autofocus speeds, I don't care what anyone says, so let's not. Or perhaps the new D850, the first Nikon since the Photomic that I actually wanted to get uh, in hand and give a go. More on that another time. We're talking a range of somewhere between ten and twenty thousand dollars for eleven to fifteen pounds of monstrously high performance gear, and then however much more for a suitably robust tripod or monopod. Although you could buy the three and a quarter pound twenty five hundred dollar uh, M Zuiko digital EB three hundred F four Pro mounted on a micro four thirds body with 2x crop like the $2,000 15 frames per second Olympus OMD EM1 Mark II or similarly priced 12 frames per second GH5 which by the way will also do 30 frames per second at 18 megapixels. Just to be clear we're talking stills burst rate. Wrap your head around that. Either body tips the scales closer to a pound each. Now we're talking 4500 bucks all in, quarter to half the price and total package weights of five pounds or less with in-body image stabilization, flippy LCD panels, and video assists the big boys can't touch. But if we're talking crop sensor body and want to get a little more versatile, I guess we should also consider a fast zoom from the big boys that covers the top end on a less expensive crop sensor body, like Canon's $11,000 EF200-400 F4, uh, on the $1,350 10 frames per second 7D Mark II or Nikon's $7,000 Nikkor 200 
to 400 millimeter ED VR2 mounted on the $1,900 10 frames per second Nikon D500. But you notice the frame rates compared to the little micro four thirds guys? You've also got your Sony Sigma or Leica zooms though, nah, nah, they're variable aperture and don't make the F4 cut at the long end. Uh, too bad because that's some really outstanding glass. Though, just for grins, remember that none of the lenses I've just mentioned will be anything but telephoto, no matter how you slice it. That's about it. Except for, right, you read the headline, you knew this was coming, but let's think about this a bit differently. The $1,700 Zeiss 8.8 to 220 2.4 to f4 zoom lens, which just happens to come with a built-in 24 frames per second burst rate shooting, newly upgraded phase detection, and touch autofocus RX10 Mark IV body with 2.7x crop thrown in for free. Well, $1,700 for the whole thing. And yeah, you heard right. 24 frames per second burst rate. That's faster than an A9. At just about two and a half pounds for the whole thing, fitting into the palm of an appropriately sized hand. Not so much for tiny hands. I know, I know, you're right. This is an outrageous apples to oranges comparison on so many levels like sensor size and bit depth, autofocus capability, build quality, EVF versus OVF, and well, wait a minute, that's about it. Because as I discovered in my extended review of the previous version, that would be the RX10 Mark III, I'll put in links below and up in one of these corners, those differences can be less significant than you might think, depending most importantly upon lighting conditions, final image display size, and distribution medium. The RX10 III, for example, held its own against an A6300 with a baddest 85mm 1.8 for portraiture and a Sony FS5 for rolling shutter, low light performance, and slow-mo. By the way, holding its own doesn't mean the same. And now, the Mark IV has phase detection autofocus, the one thing above all else that kept me from buying one a year or so ago. I mean, holy crap. And yeah, it goes all the way down to 24 millimeter full frame equivalent, my favorite wide rectilinear focal length. I mean, just wow. It had me aiming for things and putting myself in places I really shouldn't have been. Let's take a look at some of the footage. All good. This camera is capable of punching so far above its weight class in video, and it's an even better stills camera. Check this out.
credit is due. By the way, Claudia shot this one. Except I'm, I'm forgetting something. Hang on. I... Yeah. Oh, yeah. Ergonomics and usability. Right. That's the trade-off. Because my feeble attempts at humor notwithstanding, the reality is that this camera begs you to take advantage not only of an extraordinarily potent and cost-effective combination of killer lens, outstanding sensor, crazy frame rates. Beyond the nutso 24 frames per second burst mode, we're talking up to 960 frames per second, though it does kind of get a bit ugly up there, so better to stick to a max of 240 in my book, and then only under protest. And they're really quite lovely to hold body, but to video tools from focus peaking to mic and headphone jacks, S-Log, and more. Yet it is also let down by a menu system that truly, now I'll assert profoundly, gets in the way. The lack of an internal neutral density filter, the lack of a flippy rear LCD, and a single button to trigger stills and video. It takes, for example, at least four different settings scattered around the menu system to properly enable the touch focus that even Sony folks had difficulty navigating. I know this because we fumbled through it together at the shooting event. You can't move from, say, 4K 24p shooting to 1080 120 frames per second shooting without diving into the menus. This is not conducive to the decisive moment. I was going to give the lack of an internal neutral density filter a pass because the combination of relatively small sensor and a maximum aperture which quickly rises above 2.4 as you zoom in means there's really no way to expect the kind of shallow depth of field I rely on so often even with neutral density unless I have enough room both in front and behind the subject to use the long end and usually I don't. But even then the lack of an ND still impacts shutter speed in video mode, requiring very high shutter speed and that resultant signature staccato uh, in the visuals to expose correctly in good light, though it will freeze a fly in mid-flight. And I admit, I'm piggy, because screwing an internal, or rather an external neutral density filter is a royal pain and this should be my biggest problem. Now, three years ago, I didn't care if a camera's rear LCD was only a tilty. It was a dramatic improvement over no articulation at all. But with time, I've come to appreciate the ability to flip that screen out of the way of the viewfinder eye cup, which can otherwise obscure part of the view, uh, turn it around altogether for vlogging, or rotate a full 90 degrees so I can hold it high overhead and still get the shot. Finally, on more than one occasion, muscle memory, a critically important skill built up over time got in the way on the RX-10 Mark IV when I pushed the shutter release to capture video. Did you capture that? And of course, got this. On the other hand, for once, I don't care that it doesn't record past 30 minutes because I've decided to stop banging my head against the wall on that one. I don't think that the primary audience for the RX-10 Mark IV cares either. And again, I don't want to be too piggy. So, where does this leave us? Well, here. The RX-10 Mark IV is incredibly fast. As I said, 24 frames per second burst mode, that's faster than an A9. A maximum aperture of just f4 at the equivalent of 600 millimeters matched by only a handful of other lenses. Video frame rates, as I said, up to 960 frames per second. Certainly not phantom territory in terms of ultimate speed or image quality, but still, we'll call that extravagant. And finally, most importantly, a phase detection autofocus system that takes much of its tech from, in fact, the A9. The Mark IV is wildly big, at least as measured by its full-frame equivalent focal range of 24 millimeters up to that big six double zero, unmatched at that image quality. And at $1,700 here in the US, it's a huge, huge value. So maybe we should put that in the big category. Though maybe not. As someone once wrote or said in an utterly different context, 
Needless consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds, or something like that. Uh, Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson. So, yeah, never mind. But on the other hand, the Mark IV is physically and financially small, tiny when compared to anything as or more capable. But with all of this said, the RX-10 Mark IV is also slow with a menu system and physical controls that so profoundly get in the way of what the technology begs you to do that I'm pleading with you, Sony, please change both to better match the capabilities and uses of the technology packed into such an extraordinary machine. Of course, those of us who want that could just spend the time getting to learn it completely and practice. But I mean, who has the time or patience for that? Let's sum it up this way. The RX-10 Mark IV is a brilliant set of trade-offs making it an extraordinary value. An extraordinary B-cam or even A-cam when you need its particular capabilities and handling characteristics. Uh, an extraordinary choice as your only camera when in the real world you're traveling light and want to preserve as many capture options as possible. And uh, an interesting choice as your only camera when you consider yourself a casual but still enthusiast photographer. Though I'd say you'd still want an interchangeable lens camera with at least a fast prime or two. Uh, even in 2017, something like the A6000 with the delightful 28mm f2 or E50mm f1.8 if you want to stay in the Sony fold. I wouldn't make it my only camera for live events except in a pinch since it doesn't have two card slots. I'm guessing it would overheat uh, or heat up at least over the course of an event even when running below 30 minutes just through so many clips. And you might really want an f2 or 2.8 at the long end when you're at something like a low light concert. Because there is a point at which that one inch sensor just degrades. Which is why I started the review the way I did. To me, this is an exceptionally versatile, high quality optic with a sensor already attached. An amazing adjunct to the gear I or you already have. But however you choose to frame it, I'd say the RX-10 is once again best in class. It's phase detection AF trumping its closest rival, Panasonic's Z2500's built-in neutral density filters, superior app, superior menu system, and superior touch interface. And that is saying something because I think the Z2500 is a pretty compelling piece of kit. In fact, the Mark IV's phase detection autofocus is such a difference that if you loved a previous version of the RX-10 or didn't pull the trigger last time because of the contrast detect only autofocus, this could be the one attribute that puts you across the goal line for an upgrade or first time purchase. I think if it had been the four rather than the three I tested last year, I probably would have bought one. And that's all I'm going to say about that. But I do want to say a few other things. Uh, first, a general comment about camera design in the age of hybrids late in 2017. Since hybrids are here to stay, I'd encourage camera manufacturers to review the classic exposure triangle and its implication for camera ergonomics. It's the Fuji X-T2, for example, that in my view has the best hybrid ergos out there precisely because Fuji didn't forget this basic formula. The X-T2 sports aperture, shutter speed, and ISO directly accessible as dials or rings. You don't need to menu dive. And as I said earlier, this is critical in capturing the decisive moment and all cameras, maybe with the exception of action cams, should have this. Second, a plea to hybrid camera manufacturers to take camera design one step further, at least in this video. I think it's time to reconceptualize the exposure triangle altogether and add a fourth element, frame rate. Call it the capture quadrangle or cap quad for short, but I think frame rate 
should be just as easily accessible as the other three, ideally available as a collar or round, uh, or a deep second level click to press on a combined shutter release record trigger button, or maybe on the back of the camera, easily accessible underneath the thumb without having to pivot one, one's wrist. Yeah. If I never see the letters S and Q again, sorry, Sony, it will be too soon. Finally, a word or two to Sony directly. First, thanks guys, a non-gender specific term of endearment, I assure you, for putting on another great shooting event. There's a tremendous amount of planning and plain hard physical work getting a shoot together like this, and we appreciate it. Second, uh, thanks for soliciting feedback, continuing to evolve your product line rapidly, taking calculated risks, and supporting not just photographers, but artists like Nino uh, Rakachevich, who Claudia and I had the good fortune to meet this past week. He's a great guy and does just splendid work. I had an immediate, strong reaction to it. I just loved it. And with all of this said, Sony, I still wish you guys would do an FS3 too. Anyway, if you like what you've seen here today, please give a thumbs up, subscribe, uh, contribute to the conversation below because you're an amazing group of YouTube viewers. Hit the share button, add it to a playlist. And if you're so inclined, please consider using our affiliate links. They don't cost you anything or even contributing pocket money by using the PayPal link below. We thank you for it. Jeez. Remember Soupy Sales? If not, Google his name along with the words little green pieces of paper. For three blind men and an elephant, I'm Hugh Brownstone. See you next time.